Hi, my name is Jim Rossman and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator at the Wakoit Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve. Um, as a Stewardship Coordinator, um, I'm often involved with a lot of the research projects that go on here, especially the field portions of that. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about the, our Salt Marsh Observatory and some problem solving we had to go through to conduct multiple research projects in a relatively small, fragile marsh system uh, and what type of infrastructure we came up with to solve some of those problems. The Salt Marsh Observatory is down at our South Cape Beach component of the reserve and it's probably our most pristine marsh area and it's an area that because of that has gained a lot of attention for uh, both estuarine research and now uh, upland salt, salt marsh and upland interactions. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's a relatively small component uh, on the Sage Lot Pond. Hello, my name is Jordan Mora and I'm the GIS and Research Technician at the Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. And I'm standing in the Sage Lot Pond sub-estuary of the Wakoit Bay proper. And this is where we set up our salt marsh observatory. There are a couple reasons why we decided to put in a boardwalk um, for our, the section of our salt marsh observatory. Um, the first one was that we were doing a lot of field work um, over the past year and we're noticing a lot of damage to um, the salt marsh plants. Um, this is primarily because salt marsh plants are physiologically adapted to their environment, so they have what's called a ranchima in their roots, which is airspace. And if you walk on the plants, that crushes the airspace um, and um, reduces the amount of oxygen that can get facilitated to the live tissue and the plant dies. So we wanted to um, reduce some of that impact on the marsh um, by elevating um, all of the researchers that are out here. Um, so we put in a boardwalk that'll allow everyone to get around the site, but still reduce um, any of that sort of long, longer term uh, damage to the plant community. So the parameters were to get people and equipment, and equipment being, you know, that weighs up to 200 pounds, all the way from the upland edge out to the water's edge, um, multiple times uh, a week um, in all weather conditions. Uh, but we are also under the parameters that we, we obviously, our main thing, we need to protect the marsh itself. So we didn't want to drive a lot of infrastructure, a lot of permanent infrastructure into the marsh. Working with the local conservation commission, uh, we all agreed that we should make this a temporary uh, effort. It also needed to allow light to penetrate so that the, the marsh plants could still survive and grow underneath uh, any type of boardwalk infrastructure we put in. Um, and again, it had needed to be safe enough that, that people could traverse it. So it was not make it too inviting, but make it safe, uh, make it light penetrate make it heavy duty, make it temporary, and finally to make it modular because many of the researchers changed areas they wanted to work in so that we could move over and, and reach out to a new area of the marsh. We finally decided to go with uh, being down on the Cape. Uh, we have uh, a trap manufacturer near us uh, that can manufacture uh, marine traps. They do it for uh, lobster traps, crab traps, ship them all over the world. Um, we met with them, told them what we were looking for. Uh, they came up with this you know, vinyl coated 10 gauge wire it's for marine applications. Um, it's not really load tested um, because it's not meant to be used as a boardwalk, but with enough support, you know, you'll see it gets plenty of, uh, gives you plenty of support. Our first step was clearing the trail. That really marks the beginning of our efforts out here trying to create the boardwalk. Once we had the trail from the, the road to the upland uh, border of the marsh, we could start putting down actual sections of boardwalk, um, which became our second step was building the wooden frames. Um, and that happened back at our shop at the headquarters. We built a jig that sort of acts as a negative of the, the different sections where all the pieces go so that we didn't have to measure um, you know, each individual piece and its placement, which really increased our productivity and efficiency in, in building each of the sections. And then once they were uh, constructed, we brought them out to the marsh either by truck where we would carry them in from the upland or by boat, um, which means that we would bring them in to um, Sage Lot Pond and deposit the sections on the marsh um, at the seaward edge and then carry them in from the water. So Steve and I will just quickly show you how the components, the individual components go together out on the salt marsh. Um, everything is based on uh, using a milk crate as the, as the basis. The reason is, is it's nice and light. It gives you a, a good um, snowshoe design to set on the marsh. Um, you can kind of level it out with wood if need be. It again provides a little bit of light penetration. Water can flow through, through it. And uh, 
when we were working with this, one of the one of the park supervisors came up with this idea of just putting a piece of wood right through the handle of the milk crate that would that would sit on, and we'll see see how that works. So we have a milk crate on the end there. We lift up the end. Of course, we're out on the marsh. We slide that on. That catches uh, that one, and in this case, we have a four-foot piece. We can build them 12 feet, eight foot, or uh, or four foot, depending on what where we need to reach. But this could be an eight-foot piece. We just take this next one, slide it on. It locks on to there. Then on down. Then this is this piece is now ready to receive boardwalk, continuing on down and and the other direction as well. Um, uh, so that's essentially design elevated by about 12 inches off the marsh, 24 inches wide. It gives plenty of support. And then we follow up by uh, screwing the pieces together. And then finally, in uh, just to, in the tidal areas, we just take a four foot stake. We can drive that down in the marsh, simply screw that on there. Um, and the whole thing can come out by just taking the stakes off, pulling them out and lifting all the pieces back off. But, you know, simple as that, and you get you know, a good, solid, uh, light penetrating boardwalk that can handle the equipment and the people. And, you know, we put in 850 feet of it and it's already in use now, so we're pretty satisfied with the design. After that's done, we had to um, create the platforms that the measurements were actually gonna be taken. Um, so we have little, what I call satellite platforms, where the collars for the gas chambers exist. Um, once those were installed, they needed a connecting plank, and those were made out of 2 by 12 inch uh, pressure treated wood. They're most of them almost 12 feet long. And then once all of those pieces, sort of the critical pieces were in, we built a ramp up by the upland so they could get the cart up onto the, onto the boardwalk, which is sort of an important part. And then um, now we're just kind of finishing up with the finishing touches of finalizing, uh, you know, wire cutting and putting down cleats. I think the most important lesson I learned from putting this boardwalk together is many hands make light work. And I think that really, you know, says so much about the process and what we were trying to get done in a limited amount of time.